God has been speaking to us so much and so powerfully. Thank you, brother. In this great, great serious perspective, we've had help from Jennifer Beard. We've had help from Dr. Charles Travis. I've been able to share with you a few things. And today, actually, is part five of the perspective series because every perspective that's a good perspective matters. Every perspective that's a negative perspective, you can still learn from. And you see the disciples had different perspectives of the way they saw God move in various areas of their lives. We see the perspective of Jesus. That's the one I want to work on better in my own life. Talk to me, somebody. And then, of course, the, the, the perspective of the great, such as the Apostle Simon Peter, the Apostle Paul, uh, of course, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David, Moses, the greats of the Old Testament. And today I want to share something that I believe could be someone's transforming word that they really, really need to hear at this key time in their lives. I want you to go with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 27. Acts 27, and I want to begin to read at verse 13. Acts chapter 27, verse 13. Team, I think I forgot to send you the scriptures. I apologize for that. I'm reading from the, the New King James today, if you can access that for me. Uh, but that, that just means everybody gets to actually use your Bible too, amen, and your own smartphone. I want you to be familiar with it anyway. I want you to. It's good to have the screens. It's great. That's why we have them for you. But I want you to be familiar with something that you can use when you're far from this building, amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Acts chapter 27, verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea the, the sail, they sailed, excuse me, close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurachlodon. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff and difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. And fearing that they should run aground on the Certus sands, they struck sail and were so driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat upon us. In other words, this, this Eurachlodon storm is horrific. And it had, it had beat on them many days. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, some things will put you to fasting. Then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and have not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. 
For there stood before me by this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Notice that. Saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. In other words, everybody that does what you say and follows through on what I tell you, everybody's going to make it. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as he told or just as it was told me. However, we must run around on a certain island. Now, when the 14th night had come, and we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea. About midnight, the sailors sensed that they were uh, drawing near to some land. And they took soundings, and they found it to be 20 fathoms of depth. Went a little further, and they took soundings again, and they found it to be 15 fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors. Notice that. They dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff, which is the little lifeboat, the little life raft, into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in this ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes from the lifeboats. And they fell off. I want to stop there for the next few moments today. And I want to use for a subject. Properly anchored. What it is to live a life. That is properly anchored. This story is so powerful. And I, I look forward to bringing a few nuggets out of it for you. But before I tell you that. There were in the late. Well, right, right around 2009, I think it was actually 2009 exactly. But for the sake of potential human error on my part, almost certain it was 2009, there were four football players, two of them pro football players, two of them college players, who went out on a fishing trip, a fishing excursion together. And they went, I think, somewhere between 40 and 50 miles offshore to fish. I understand by the reports after it was over that they, that they partied and they did a lot of things and they did things that lost people do. And they made much fun and did the things they planned on doing. But they had some things happen but they didn't, that they didn't plan on happening. The boat capsized. Those were tremendously conditioned athletes. Three out of four of them lost their lives that day. And when they gave a report after they did an investigation of the situation as to how this happened, the report said this. The reason why the boat capsized is because it was improperly anchored. Improperly anchored. They knew how to drive the boat. Probably even know how to anchor the boat. But in some, for some reason that we do not know, for some reason that I don't know because I wasn't there, they improperly anchored the boat. It capsized. Three out of the four lost their lives. And it really just didn't have to happen that way. But there are a lot of things that happen ways that they don't have to happen because people's lives are improperly anchored. And I want to show you today how to be properly anchored. But in order to understand how to be properly anchored, you've got to realize there is a way to be improperly or non-properly anchored. There are many people that are not anchored at all. But they're tied to things. They're tied to bondage. The bondages can be various. The bondages can be quite diverse. But they're tied to bondage. They're tied and their neck is in a noose. They sometimes think they have the world by the throat. They sometimes think that I'm in control. I know what I'm doing. I've considered all the variables. I'm smarter than all the people that came before me. 
You don't say those things. But your behavior shows that's really kind of how you think. And rather than being anchored properly in something that is eternal, but close attention, they are tied to a bondage. And they let that bondage dominate their life. That bondage controls their life. If it's chemical substance abuse, if it's unforgiveness, if it's immorality, if it's pride, if it's fear, it's a bondage. And anything that is a bondage is never something that pleases God. God's people only got into bondage when they pull back from God, they chose a way of sin, they chose an alternate life other than the life that God had planned for them, which was always going to be better than the life they chose. If God had ever made a choice that was not as good as ours, then we shouldn't trust Him. But every decision God has ever made for us is better than the best choice or idea we'll come up with. But we get to thinking sometimes, as smart and as bright as we are, we get to, as Orzel's daddy used to say, we get to smell in our own britches sometimes. <laughs> and we think in our minds, and our actions prove it, whether we want to have enough guts to admit it or not, that we know better than God. And so we give place to a bondage. But nobody gets bound by a bondage the first time they fool with it. It, it, it is something that happens over a systematic amount of time. And a bondage is a terrible thing to be tied to. But every one of us know people that we care about and love that are tied to bondages. They're not anchored to anything worth being anchored to, but they're tied to bondages. And it's terrible. It's a hell way to live. And they put up this front because they've surrendered their life to being tied to a bondage and they've got to hide behind a lie because, I mean, after all, when you've pretty well chewed yourself up and run yourself down and lived a life that if you admit I was wrong, then you, the devil says you're really going to look stupid then because you've burned bridges and you've, you, you've ruined your life, you've wrecked your life, there's no hope for you. By the way, the devil is lying. But if you believe him, his lie becomes your truth. Oh God, am I preaching or what? It's not a what, baby, I'm preaching. Hallelujah, you need to hear this now. But, but, but tied to bondage. and we, 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 There's not a family in this room that doesn't have somebody tied to bondage. There are Christians that are tied to bondage. And the good news today is we're not supposed to be tied to any kind of bondage. Jesus came to free us from the shackles and the chains and the ties and the bindings of bondage. Period. Oh, well, God's trying to get glory out of my bondage. Now, God will get glory by getting you out of your bondage. But God didn't put you in bondage. But guess what he will do? He'll bring you into freedom. <laughs> but if you choose to be tied to bondage, and if you stay with the thing that's killing you, you made the decision to be tied to it. Oh, I can't help myself. I'm a victim. Well, you are a victim, but you still have the ability to make a decision. Or God is a liar. And God is not a liar. I promise you, He never lies. It may be difficult because you've made a number of bad decisions perhaps that have bound you so much that your flesh will scream and kick and throw fits. But if a bad decision can give place to a bondage and tie you to it, a good decision, a God decision, a good choice can see you freed from a bondage. And I just got to say it today. This is not the focal point of my message. But you can't preach the gospel if you don't preach both sides of it. And the good news is, is as bad as the curse is, Jesus is the bondage breaker. Jesus is the game changer. Not your idea of Jesus, but the reality of who Jesus is. Because Jesus is not a philosophy. Jesus is not an opinion. Jesus is not a scapegoat. Jesus is not someone for people that are just weak and need a crutch to lean on. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and he's chosen to be your big brother and he's chosen to be your intercessor and is anybody glad today that he's your savior if you're grateful thunder up to him a clap offering in this room today so if you got enough guts to quit calling you a bondage 
the opposite of what it is. But admit you have a bondage. Because it's the lion that keeps you bound. God can help anybody. But even God can't change a liar. Because a liar lives a life that resists the truth. But if you can lie, you can say yes to truth. That's wonderful news. I mean, even you habitual liars, you can say yes to truth. I mean, even you people that have lied so much, you can't tell hardly the difference between the truth and the lie because you've lied so long about it. You made yourself believe it, believe it is the truth. You can change. Well, Pastor, you're getting a little bit too tough, aren't you? Oh, I'm not getting near as tough as I want to get. Because, see, I see the reality of the screw up of people's lives. I see the reality of what they're doing to themselves. When you're blind, you can't see. But when people that their eyes, I used to be blind. I remember what it was like. But when people around you that love God and love you, when they see things, they see the realities of what the blindness and the bondage has and is doing to you. They see how it's affecting you. They see how it's withering you away. They see how it's affecting everybody that loves you. They see how it's devouring your relationships. How that it's forfeiting your future. Because you can choose to live in your past. But if you choose to live in your past, you will live without a future. And we've all got a past. Even if you've got a halo spinning on your horns, I promise you, we've all got a past. But is anybody grateful today you don't have to live in the mess of a past that once was? I know I'm being very, very direct. But you've got to be direct because sometimes direct is the only thing. It's, it's a kind of love that's not popular, but it's a kind of love that is necessary. It is not condemnation. It is confrontation. And it says, hey, you may have the hangman's noose around your neck, and if you do, don't look in the mirror and tell another lie. Look in the mirror and say, I'm going to die, God, if you don't help me. God, I'm going to go down the tubes if you don't help me. And that's what people in this church did. They reached the end of their rope. They reached the end of themselves. And rather than going ahead and doing what Satan had tried to get them to do all along the way, destroy themselves. They cried out to God and said, it's around my neck. It's a, I'm about, the chair's about to tip over. I'm about to hang because I'm tied to bondage. But Lord, if, you, if you'll help me, I'll serve you. And guess what he does? Guess what he does every time? God always runs to the rescue of a person who says, I don't want this anymore. Not just the person that says, I want my bondage, but I want Jesus. Don't make me cuss. <laughs> I'm not going to cuss. Don't freak. <laughs> That's a bunch of crap. With a capital C. I want my bondage plus Jesus. So you want to pee on the blood. Huh? You want to defecate on the mercy. If he loves you enough, to get this thing off from around your neck. Then you ought to love him enough to say. Take it devil. Yeah. Have at it. Above all take it Jesus. Yeah. Take it Jesus. Have at it. Because I don't want that anymore. Amen. And if there's any craving in your life. As a result of bad choices and decisions. That you have for an old bondage. I'm telling you. If you'll. Just fling yourself over on the mercy and the grace of God. He, by the fire of the Holy Spirit, will set you at liberty from that which you cannot set yourself free from. Can you give me Shout yes! I'm going to leave it right there for you to look at, though, because if you want to be tied to bondage, look at it. That's what's got you. Except it's not that pretty. It's not cute. It's not just an illustration. It's choking you. I love this great text, the Apostle Paul. They shouldn't even made this journey at the time they did. He warned them, I don't feel good about this, guys. I don't feel good about this. But he's their prisoner. Even though he's the man in control, he's the prisoner. It's kind of wild when you're Joseph and you're in control really of the whole world, but Pharaoh is the figurehead, but you're the second in command. Really, you're the in command because you're the one hearing from God. You're the one 
knowing what to do in a time of famine. You're the one who's divinely influenced by Almighty God. And the Apostle Paul says, we don't need to make this trip, but they overrode. That's the other parts of these verses I didn't get a chance to read to you. They overrode the wisdom of God through the Apostle Paul. And so what they don't know is because they don't have the weather channel. They don't have the weather app. They don't know that this Eurachlodon, typhoon, hurricane, proportion type storm, this horrific storm is coming directly in their path. And so they didn't need to be in that ship, but they got in that ship. And so Paul, the man of God, is put in a place that really was not God's best plan for him. But here's the beauty of if you are in the will of God yourself. Oh man, I feel the Holy Ghost. You may be put into situations that are not God's will for your life. But if you are choosing to live in the current now will of God for your life, no matter where you get put by people who may put you in a bad place, it will not be able to stop you. And while you're in that situation, you will be used as an instrument to save everybody that wants it. Oh my God, are you hearing what I'm saying? Some of you like I'm speaking in tongues and you don't have the interpretation. But others of you get it. Some of you sit back there like, oh, I don't know if this is a word for me. Yes, it is. They're all a word for you. They're all a word for you. Get to growing up. Pull up your big boy and your big girl draws. They're all a word for you. Sometimes the biggest word for you is the one your flesh doesn't want to hear because you don't think it's necessary. But the reality is it may be more necessary than anything you've heard maybe in three years because it addresses the area of your life that's given place to the devil. But if God addresses it, he won't beat your brains out over what you've given place to. He'll show you how to give place to the liberty and the freedom that comes from the gospel and the Holy Ghost. Woo! The Bible said that uh, they were driven by the wind. Paul said, at night God visited me. He told the people, he said, God visited me and told me that everything's going to be okay. The circumstances were not all pleasant, but everything is going to be fine. And if you do what I tell you, Nobody on this boat is going to die. That ain't no big deal when it's smooth sailing. But when you're on this boat and you can't hardly tell daytime from nighttime because the sky is so dark and so black and you're driven by winds that are out of control and you, no matter how skilled you are, you cannot control the direction that you're going because you're out of position, because you did not listen to the voice of wisdom, and you didn't give place to what you should have, and so you're just driven, and there's nothing else to do but to just have hope against hope and just trust. But you got somebody on the boat with you, thus the value of godly relationships. Is anybody grateful that you've got some people in your life that you know are full of the Holy Ghost, that you know are close to God, that you know have a walk with God, and that you can depend on them in moments of difficulty and circumstance? Amen. That's a huge thing. Because to my knowledge, even though there were some people that respected Paul, to my knowledge, he's the only saved man in the sense of born again, new birth, on the boat at this point. Right. <laughs> Seemed like to me everybody on the boat is about to experience a relationship with Jesus. Now look, I'm just going to say something here. If you're on the boat with a Holy Ghost man of God and your life is being driven by a storm and you know if God doesn't intervene, you are going to die. You are crazy if you don't call on the name of the Lord of this Holy Ghost filled man. But here's the thing about it. There was no pressure. Paul didn't say, I hope y'all are in agreement with me. I believe in the power of agreement. But Paul wasn't asking for agreement with a bunch of heathens. He said, I believe God because I heard His voice. How many of you have ever heard God's voice? Have you ever heard Him speak through His Word? Have you ever heard Him speak through a song? Have you ever heard Him speak to you through a sermon? I'm preaching. Are you hearing me? Have you ever heard him speak to you through the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever heard him speak 
to you because I promise he's speaking. And sometimes we don't acknowledge what he says. But Paul said, I believe God. And it don't look good. It don't look any different than it did before I heard from God. And we're doing everything we can to, to do what we know to do. And they were trying stuff that if they'd asked Paul, Paul might have said, no, don't do that. But they, they were just desperate. They're de desperate people do crazy stuff. Just try to save somebody. Don't try to save somebody, by the way. Let me back up and say that and, and correct that. But if you try to save somebody that's drowning and they don't realize what you're doing and you're not skilled at what you do, they may drown you too. Because desperate people go crazy. Because nobody wants to die. I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to die. Loretta Lynn, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> I little boy, she sang that song. Probably sung it for us a little boy. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. I can tell she's from Tennessee, I think. I'm ready to die, I just don't want to. Well, brother, you should be more spiritual. Well, forgive me. Forgive me. But I was born to live. When you're born of the Spirit, you realize you were born to live. And death is an enemy that's been swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. But now death is not the finality. Death is a passing through place. It's not the period. It's a pause that you pass through on your way into the eternal day. But I didn't, they didn't want to die, so they're doing everything. They're throwing stuff. They're throwing food overboard. Man, don't throw the food. Don't throw the food. Come where you at, Orzel, when I need you. Don't throw the food, man. <laughs> Orzel and the Holy Ghost have this in common. Where there's food, he'll be in the midst. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, I, I'm, that, I'm the same way, Orzel. I just love to pick at you. I know you're around here somewhere. But they're, they're, throwing, every, they're throwing everything they can, trying to lighten the load. And then all it's doing is just driving them more. But finally, Paul says, if you try to get in that little lifeboat, anybody that don't stay on this boat is going to die. Well, it's about to shipwreck. You better get out of the boat. <laughs> yeah, but if you get out of the boat, you're going to get into the storm. Worse. I'm speaking to somebody today. You are in a storm. You're in a horrendous storm in your life. But what you don't need to do I promise you, it may look rough from the boat, but it's way worse out of the boat. I'm preaching, come on now. When the Holy Ghost says, stay in the boat, stay in the boat. Yeah. Well, I'm just logical. No, you're, you're, you're improperly anchored and you are very misinformed. The Holy Ghost, can I drop a bomb on you, baby? The Holy Ghost is smarter than you. I said, the Holy Ghost knows some stuff you don't know. God knows some variables you don't know. We talked about it in men's group this morning. Trust is the highest level of faith. You want to be trusted, but will, but will you trust God? Oh, I'm preaching better than you're letting on. Will you trust God? Will you choose to trust God? I've just got to have, I've just got to understand everything. Well, then you're going to miss out on a lot of things because God ain't going to explain everything to you at every given moment that you want Him to. But if you'll trust Him, trust in Him with all your heart, Proverbs 3 says. And don't lean into your own understanding. Don't let it distract you. But in all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. God was directing these people all the way to the beach, but they had a shipwreck to go through in the process. So you little rubber boot, you little kayak, you little John boat, little Jenny boat, then what the girls feel left out. You little row, row, row your boat. Don't get in it. And they cut the boats loose. They cut the boats loose. But listen, the scripture said at the same time, right at that same time, they lowered four anchors. They anchored the boat with four things they could depend on. And here's where I want to begin to spend this. The first thing, it's important. Everybody say properly anchored. Now just turn to somebody and say, he's about to put on a belt. Praise God. It's 
You may take a second. Maybe not. You've got to be. You're going to make it through the storms of life. You've got to be. And the Word of God will come to you. You've got to be anchored to the Word of God. Oh, I carry a Bible that I don't use. Oh, I've got, we've got them. We, we, they're all through our house. While well, they collect dust in various places. I'm not a jerk. I'm just kind of being a little raw today. Come on, love me back. Love me back. You think I'm too rough? Get over it. I'm, I'm, way, I'm way better than what the devil would love to do with the storm you're in. I'm a good news bringer. Trust me. Trust me. To be anchored. Anchored to the Word of God. Psalm 119, 105. His Word is a lamp unto my feet. Even in the dark times. They were praying for daylight to come. I mean, whether it's day or night time, they can't tell the difference. They're praying for daylight to come. Do I have anybody under the sound of my voice? You've been praying for daylight to come. You need to be anchored to the Word of God. It's a lamp to your feet. It's a light into your path. It's not just the good book. It's not just that old good book. It's, it's not just that, that, that book of good intentions and good advice. But it is the Word that is living. It is Logos, which means it's written. But it's Rhema, which means it's quickened and it's alive. To be anchored to the Word of God. If you're anchored to the Word of God, you'll weather things that other people cave into. If you're anchored to the Word of God, when you start fussing at God about your mate and you start telling God everything that's wrong with your mate that you're married to, let me qualify that, that you're married to, and the Lord begins to talk to you about you and quote Scripture to you as He talks to you. But the reason why He talks to you is you said, I have chosen to be anchored to the Word of God. I've not chosen to play with the Word of God. I've not chosen to vaguely from a distance claim the Word of God or just amen the Word of God, but I've chosen to believe the Word of God and be anchored with the Word of God. He'll talk to you about things and He will show you the way. He'll make it clear. He'll give you direction. He'll give you grace when you don't understand. He'll bring a fix to your life. He'll bring recovery to your life. He'll help you step into the ministry of reconciliation rather than the ministry of tear it apart and devastation. The Word of God, to be anchored to the Word of God. And the great thing about it is, if I don't cut the rope, the Word of God will never cut me loose. I've chosen to be anchored. I've been anchored to Him for a long time. I love preaching this illustrated sermon, but the reason why it's so alive in my life is because I discovered by seeing other people that are, were far greater Christians than I maybe will ever be, I watched how being anchored to the Word of God raised and elevated in their lives and I thought you know what I might not be the brightest bulb of all of them but if it worked for them and God said it'll work for me I believe God I'm going to anchor my life to the word of God not anchored it to being a Baptist or being a Methodist or being a charismatic or a Pentecostal or a Catholic and there's some great believers in all those groups whether you like it or not but anchored to the word not the tradition, not the sin, the Word of God. You want something that will last? His Word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit into the joints and marrow and is the discerner of the very thoughts and the intents of the heart anchored to the Word of God. In You, Lord, in Your Word I live. In Your Word I breathe. In Your Word I move. In Your Word I have my being. And, and everything I need, You address it. And if I'm willing to mine this book of diamond nuggets, golden nuggets, and kingdom blessings, He will address the situation of my life. If y'all will amen me quick, I can get some other anchors. Because I want you to be properly anchored. I don't want you living a fake life saying you're real. You see that spin in the video? Real Fake. How that they were able to take the word real and the word fake and spin it. I want you to be real people. Anchored on the word of God. 
that's more real is Dwight Thompson's daddy used to say, the old great evangelist Dwight Thompson's daddy, old Assembly of God preacher, pastored the same church for over 60 years. God is more real to me than my right hand. And the reason why you believe God's more real to you than your right hand is because God's word is more true to you than any other word. Amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap? Yeah. There's another anchor. Another anchor that we need to be properly anchored to. Yes, I'll say it, Lord. And it's God's purpose for your life. Because when you give over to what God has, my purpose is no longer just my purpose. Because purpose is only really understood by God. And that's the reason why you don't hear the word purpose talked about unless it's really kingdom talk. Let me share a few things with you the Lord said to tell me. And by the way, I choose to be anchored to the purpose of God in my life. It's kept me from quitting. It's kept me on point. I feel compelled to say this. Natural life throws to us various types of storms, doesn't it? The presence of storms is never an indication of the absence of God. Would you shout amen? amen. Huh? What, 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 but, but the world says, if God's so good, why are you having a challenge? Because they don't know what they're talking about. There's a lot of enemies to the blessing of God, the plan of God, the people of God. But though there may be many afflictions to the righteous, our God delivers us out of them all. Are you hearing me? Believed promises, hear this now. Believed promises often encounter storms of opposition to try and make you believe that God has left you and is no longer with you. The devil is a liar. And that statement is very true, isn't it? Many are not anchored at all. They're tied to bondage. The, those who have chosen to be anchored to the Word of God realize that God's got... <laughs> he, he talks about it all. That's why I know if you're really in the Word, at some point, you'll quit being a whiner and start being a winner. Because we've all been whiners. If you say you ain't been a whiner, we just didn't hear you. Come on. Don't make it worse by lying. But you'll quit because the Word will lead you out of being a whiner into becoming a winner. Amen. Don't y'all love me? I, I just feel the love coming my way today. God's purpose for my life. Anchored to God's purpose. Your purpose was here before you got here. God said, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the belly of your mother, I knew you. So in other words, way before your daddy even winked at your mama, much less <laughs> smooched up on her big time. Your purpose was already designed because you came through people, but you came from God. According to the Bible, don't try and change. This is huge. This is so important. Yes, Holy Spirit. Don't try and change your personality to meet your purpose. Because when you do, you lose your identity. And the real you will never be known. But listen, your personality will meet your purpose as you fight the good fight of faith and not against it. Your personality will meet your purpose because your personality is part of your purpose. Not your personality gone crazy, but your personality gone kingdom. Oh, man, man, oh, man, I'm going to buy this CD, get in the room somewhere, replay it, and scream and shout so everybody will know how much somebody enjoyed this. Amen. Understanding your purpose will enable you to go through what others run from and never get away from. If you run from your purpose, chasing something that's not for you, Chasing something that really shouldn't even be part of your life because you saw something that you thought that would be neat to have. It would be neat to be them. I'm not very much, but it would be neat to be them. You'll never know your purpose that way. And you need to hear that because all of us have seen people that we admire and we see greatness in them and we think, gosh, they're so much greater than I am. But there might have been a day 
when they weren't great at all. There might have been a day when they seemed totally worthless, but they let their personality go kingdom. And they, oh, I'm preaching. And they kept going after God. And God made something great of them because they gave Him something to work with. And purpose was given place to. I'm telling you, I'm just, I'm demanding it of you. I don't demand many things, but by Holy Ghost Cracky, I am demanding this one today. Let your personality have a collision with God's purpose for your life. I'm anchored to God's purpose for my life. I'm going to get me a watch without batteries. Get one just for looks. Just get one for looks. Everyone say anchored, anchored. To, the word of God. to the Word of God. Anchored, anchored. to purpose. purpose. There's something else though. There's, an, there's another anchor. We, they, they drop four. We're going, we, we drop in four too. Hallelujah. Number three. Anchored to worship. I said it a minute ago. See, some people act like worship is an option. I mean, I, I just, I can't, I can't get over it. I turn around and I look at y'all sometimes. And there's just some, you don't know who I'm talking about. And, and honestly, just go on and mind your business. Because you don't have my job. And you just keep on, because I don't want you worrying about what other people do. But I'm a leader. So I some people, and, and they just don't get it. They think, oh, I, you know, I will get past this worship part. Don't ever get past the worship part. You will never know God deeply until you become a worshiper. And you don't have to worship like me, but acting like you won't get involved, if you don't get involved in an atmosphere like this, you don't do it any other place. That's a faith laugh for you that need it. None of us can whine and worship at the same time. So anchor yourself to worship. I don't just... It's held me together. It's grown me up. And it's not only the lifting of my hands, but it is that. It's not only the allowing Him to wash me with His presence, but it is that. It's not only the clapping and the shouting and the rejoicing, but it is that. But it's also the way I treat my wife. It's also the way I treat my kids. It's also the way I treat you. It's also the way I treat this platform of my life. Worship. But if, if it's not to Him first, then I don't even think about the other stuff. Are you listening to me? Turn your worry into worship and watch God turn storms and battles into blessings. <laughs> I'm going to wrap that, I think. Not really. <laughs> Ethel, I think he's having too much fun. Get over it, Ethel. Give me a break. I'm having fun today. Turn worry into worship and watch God turn storms and battles into blessings. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's got to tell you that one more time. Turn worry into worship because we all battle with worry. Everybody battles with it, but you conquer it by turning worry into worship and say, I will not waste the energy worrying. I choose to invest it in worshiping. Somebody shout. It's a good thing that I'm anchored to worship my purpose, God's purpose for my life in the Word, because I would run and drag these anchors all over this building. <laughs> and I'm connected to them, not just them to me. So, thank you, Lord. For this illustration, for yea, thou, I neededest it. <laughs> Life isn't always about waiting. Listen, this is huge. Life isn't always about waiting for the storms to pass. It's also about learning to dance in the rain. I walked into my house one day after about a four or five mile run. Sweat pouring off over me. I'm standing at the... the the bar there in our kitchen, the bar that we eat off of, we don't drink off of it. So. I'm on social media. Got to be clear. 
And I, I stand and I'm looking, and up on top of my refrigerator is a, is a gift someone's giving us, given us. It might have been on top of my refrigerator for a year. I don't know how long it had been there. But I looked at it and it said, Life's not about waiting for the storms to pass. It's also about learning to dance in the rain. And if you wait till the sun's shining perfectly and there's not a trace of a cloud in the sky, if you wait till there's no possibility of a storm, you will miss out on a high percentage of your life of what worship could do and how you could learn to dance in the rain. I promise you, you won't freak the devil out. Dance in the rain. Celebrate in the storm. Worship according to his worship in the crazy days. Listen, Abraham... The Bible references him in Romans 4, verse 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Oh, man, what a life this man lived. He didn't have the blood of Jesus. He didn't have the baptism in the Holy Ghost. He didn't have a um, 66-book volume book, the Bible that I have. But he had something real with God. And he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Don't ever quit worshiping, Josh. Get better at it. Don't ever hold back in your worship. Get better at it. Now, you know, the realities are, I don't want my, I don't want my worship to, to be something that causes attention to get over on me. But I want my worship, I want our worship. I want our worship to cause attention to get over on Jesus. So I don't just want to worship this morning. I want to worship this evening. I want to worship while I'm driving down the road. I, w- I want to worship in the tough times. I want to worship when it's, I can't tell if it's day or night. I want to worship when it feels like I'm being driven by winds other than the wind of the Holy Ghost. I want to worship in the most challenging days. I want to worship when I'm hurting so bad I don't know what to do. I want to worship when it feels like God is not as close as He promised me He would always be. Because I promise you this much, if God said it would be that way it will always be that way and worship keeps you from being a feeler worship causes you to be a believer is anybody grateful today that as fickle as feelings can be thank God for the good ones but as fickle as feelings can be worship keeps you grounded and at the same time lets you fly I wish you'd turn to someone and say learn to dance baby learn to dance in the rain we were at a wedding celebration last night we had so much fun. Ecclesiastes says there's a time to dance. And we, had, we, we just cut up and acted like a bunch of kids. And there wasn't no drugs and there wasn't no alcohol. Wasn't no bunch of stupid stuff going on. But we were dancing and having a big time. and Just, just acting crazy and enjoying life. You think I'm going to do that out there and come in here and act like a chosen, frozen, six foot three icicle looking at a bunch of people that act like they, they don't, they hate God much less. No, we, we are the people of God. Raise your hands because you're not ashamed of whose you are. We worship Him because of who He is. Amen. I anchored to worship. I'm, I, I'm, I gotta quit. Look, y'all, now, I know it's after 12. Usually at this time, I have already moved into the altar call. But today, that's obviously not the case. But I cannot leave this message with just three anchors. And we're about to shout our way out of this place in a little bit. Look at your neighbor and say, it's good, honey. You brought your shouting shoes today because you was going to need them. (laughs) You was going to need them. I got to tell somebody before I give you this fourth anchor. And fourth anchor man, begin to move toward it if you would. We have more than a good, good day or a bad, bad day or a crazy, crazy day. We have a good, good Father. So if it's a bad, bad week or a bad, bad day or a bad, bad storm, we got a good, good Father who can change it all, 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 all ways. One more. Can y'all shift that way just a little bit, team? Thank you so much because I want everybody to see it. The house of God made itself available to me. Notice it. How that all of these came to me. Opportunity came to me. But it's up to me whether or not I'll be anchored in the house of God. We now live in a generation of Christians that either don't know what it is to be anchored to the house of God 
or are in rebellion about being anchored to the house of God. Listen to me. We tell God what we will do. We tell God what we won't do. We give God as much of us as we want to give Him. And we expect Him to understand and we call it His will. But it might not be His will just because you said it. Amen. To be anchored to the house of God is a privilege. Right. To be anchored to the house of God has kept me. And I choose to not just claim the house. I'm anchored. Look at your neighbor and say, my pastor, he hooked you up. He hooked you up. <laughs> Jessica's back there working the camera going. I mean, she's, she's doing Morse code with her hand. <laughs> to be anchored to the house of God. What does, what does that mean? At some points in the circumstances of life, even the greatest of Christians drift a little. I've never met a Christian that has never drifted a little. I don't lose confidence in people who drift. I gain confidence in people who drift and get back on course. And our self, I'm about to cuss. You ever hear the preacher cuss? And our self-corrective that don't even have to necessarily have, uh, 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 but because again, a sermon to cause them to stop drifting. Because they have something valuable. They have the Word of God. They value God's purpose for their life. They're so anchored to worship. And they get access to all of that and then some by being anchored to the house of God. And you'll hear all kinds of things, all kind of trendy things. And, and there's a truth to some of it, but there's a lie to a lot of it. That, you know, I mean, it just, it just, you know, the church is the people. That's true. But there's something about the gathering of the church that the Scripture is emphatic on. The Old Covenant, they gathered, the twelve tribes gathered around the ark and the tabernacle of Moses. In the New Covenant... Hebrews says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. One translation says, as the habit of some is. And there are some of you that this is very uncomfortable ground. Because you're not nearly as connected to the house of God as you ought to be. And it's reflecting in your life. What's he talking about? Well, that might be part of it. That suck offended attitude. Nobody had that. It was just a joke. That was just a joke. If you had that, it wasn't a joke. <laughs> but, but if you... I don't know if I like you or not. I love you though. I love you. Right, but right now, I'm almost like this. I got one friend. I'm crazy about you, but I got one friend. Because I can't fix you. You obviously can't fix you. There's a lot of things we don't know. But in the house of God, there's help. You know, this guy holding this today. I wish we, I want way of life to be way more for him than it has been. But if 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 Boo Boo took a little time, and I'm not going to ask him to because that's not the, he's already preaching good by holding this sign. But he could probably tell you some things about how the house of God has been huge, an influence in his life, and that's the way we all should see it. But at some point, everybody's life drifts a bit. We've all drifted at certain moments. But don't die and lose everything in a drifting life. But if we're anchored to the house of God, we will never drift and be lost at sea. I may drift a little bit, but I got my floaties, man. I'm anchored. I can't go but so far. And I go, and there's an end to this rope. And I'm telling you, you better quit justifying. Disconnect with the house of God. Because I promise you, you might not can see what it's doing to you, but I can. You may blame me for stuff that's your own fault. 
But you won't blame me for not talking to you about it. And look, I'm not, I'm not, don't, don't go where, you, don't go into any assumption. All I'm asking us to do is to be honest. Not with what Chris Owens be thinks, but with what God thinks. And how valuable the house of God has been to our lives, as has the Word of God been. And don't just pick one of these three or two out of the four. Don't be stupid. You're a child of God. You need to be anchored to all of them. Three of them still ain't enough. You can still be skull drug. But if you're anchored in all of them, they fortify one another. And here's the thing. They still had a shipwreck. With all the anchors. But nobody died. Everybody made it to the beach. I personally, I wasn't there, but I personally think all of them born again. I mean, some of them probably come up on the beach talking in tongues, man, by the time they got there. Because when you, when you think you're about to die and God saves your, <clears throat> not only your neck, but your everything. Ooh, that'll change, that'll change your life. Yo, yo. I'm out of time. You can't anchor your soul in improper things. If you do, it will destroy your life. And if you're shallow, you'll blame God. You must anchor your soul in eternal provisions of God. And these four represent so much more than even this. The big question today, and I need the team to come and join me. And they know what I mean. I'll tell you all when to sing. We're going to, sing, we're going to go out of this place singing a worship song in a few minutes. But the big question today is, are you properly or improperly anchored? Because if you're capsizing, you're improperly anchored. I've had my boat go all over the place. I've been driven by storms. But I've never capsized. In my days with God, here's why. Because I've stayed close to these. Not because, oh, Brother Chris, you're such a wonderful Christian. No, I'm just, I'm just a country boy who believes in God. And I'm not just humble. I've stayed close to these. And they've kept me. Greater people than me aren't even in church anymore. Listen to me. I've known people that jump and run and shout and dance and were sincere about it and they love God, but they're, they're, they hate God now. They blame God for what they did not ever get anchored to. They weren't devils. They just never got anchored because they wouldn't obey the truth. God is not the happy sugar daddy of glory that just gives out trinkets. He's our, uh, he, he gives wonderful gifts. You better know it. But He's our almighty God who also gives anchors and gives expansion and He gives increase. How many of you can look at these four things and realize at different times they've saved your life? Amen. Can you see that? Because I know there's a number of believers back there. I feel your strength. I feel you, I feel you agging me on. But, but as, as, as we stop, because I'm out of time. I've been out of time. Living on us. No, that's not appropriate. Living on Ganader time. You remember O.H. Austin, brother? He said, Brother Chris was preaching him one time. Oh, Brother Austin. He said, let's go to Ganader. I thought, are you from Alabama? <laughs> Good neighbor. The big question today is, are you properly or improperly anchored? And you've got to answer that for yourself. Those who make it through storms have been properly anchored. And I'm going to tell you something else. You become the greatest testimonies to a broken world that there is a way of victory. I don't deserve the credit. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. 
Father, thank you for causing all of us to take hold of what you bring and who you are and what you provide. Let it never be said that we were improperly anchored again. Thank you for always helping us, never condemning us, always raising us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause His countenance to shine upon you. May the Lord continue to establish you on His ways. May He grant you peace. I love you big time. God bless you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, thank you.